Hi and welcome. In, uh, in this section, we are going to discuss the number that moves the world, the unemployment rate. So um, we can probably um, intuit or be at least a little bit familiar with what the unemployment rate talks about. Um, actually, right, it's a, it's, a, it's a broad measure that basically looks at the, um, the number of people that um, are currently employed in the United States and then compares it to, or, you know, in um, also in, in countries all over the world, but we look at it in the U.S. in particular. So you have the, the number of people working in the U.S. and then we compare it to um, the number of people either working or who are actively seeking to be working. And the reason we make that adjustment is, for example, if you're uh, 10 years old and you are currently attending school, that is in some sense kind of your job according to society, but we wouldn't really call you employed because you're not working for wages. Um, also, there are few, if you are retired, it's not really fair to call you um, unemployed if you're independently you know, if you can maintain a middle class lifestyle based on your retirement savings and social security. And so it's very reasonable to think about limiting who in this universe of people we consider to be um, not employed that could have been. Um, but the, uh, the, the notion of the unemployment rate is to really stick to folks that, um, that are looking to, f to find work and haven't yet. And, to people who are employed. So if we think back to the Depression era where you can say, well, there were, you know, we had a ton of people that were working recently that were out of work, that were hoping to find new work, and maybe they were standing in a bread line or a soup line, but they could have been standing at a corner with a sign um, asking for, for employment. And so those those people would definitely be considered job seekers and 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 so if you go back to the depression era we get unemployment rates in you know as high as 30 percent and um in parts of the uk um that during that same time it was 60 and up to 80 percent in small parts so um we have these huge differences in the employment rate in the measured unemployment rate and um, it's actually very important to us because if we think about um, uh, um, our economic lives and the lives of our fellow citizens, when we when we live in a society that has a high unemployment rate, that's associated with quite a bit of suffering and uncomfortableness, and also um, represents um, to a great degree some. Um, uh, some disruption. I mean, these, you know, usually there's something, you know, in the past, this, these kind of things happen around banking panics and company failures and, and the unemployment rate, large spikes in the unemployment rate are, um, go hand in hand with, um, big declines in wealth across the spectrum, not just in everyday workers. And so, um, the unemployment rate is a really important, um, measure to think about for these reasons, right, that it, it sort of, it, it represents in a small, right, in a small measure, what, um, what maybe sort of the, the feeling is for everyday folks in their everyday working life. If you're, um, even if you're employed, if the unemployment rate is high, maybe you're not feeling so secure in your job, or maybe you're now limited in other employment opportunities you could go get, um, which can lead to um, wage stagnation or other problems, right? So, um, and uh, this is also something that's important to um, uh, to politicians, right? We talk about um, helping get people to work and reducing unemployment is something they can adjust or help via policy. And so, you know, political, um, you know, so political campaigns that, that are not addressing unemployment can suffer serious consequences. So a good example of that would be uh, George Bush Sr. Um, 
by most accounts, by the end of his presidency, the U.S. was um, just starting to emerge from a recession. But um, the uh, the messaging from President Bush as a candidate wasn't re wasn't resounding well with people who were newly experiencing job loss or job loss from friends or reduced economic opportunities, and that ultimately was uh, detrimental to his re-election campaign. It's not all too often that presidents are unseated for their second term, but he was in that case. So, um, so yeah, so we, th we think about, about un unemployment rate, but it's, it's important to realize, just like GDP, that there are some issues with measuring this appropriately. And this came up a lot during this last, you know, the Great Recession, so to speak, the last one, when there were a bunch of people that just had became so disillusioned with the economy that they just gave up. And so when you just give up, according to the, you know, a published official employment statistic, um, you're no longer a job seeker. And so you no longer count for um, someone seeking a job. And so you quitting looking for work actually decreases the unemployment rate because you're no longer in the pool of job seekers. So, um, right, that can seem a little funny, but we don't have a great way to differentiate people that just give up with people who um, are voluntarily retiring, right? These things can sort of overlap a little bit, right? Maybe you voluntarily retired because you didn't have better opportunities, and so you're sort of a forced retirement. We remember probably a lot of people doing that around that time, or, you know, people then, for example, education that we're leaving um, in mass around, you know, the, the time of the Great Recession while their pensions were still good. So, um, so yeah, so uh, unemployment is something we want to think about a lot and think about how it's measured and maybe can think about other ways to measure it and how it affects things. So this is a, a graph of unemployment back to the 50s from um, the Federal Reserve. And you can see this is a this is a wildly changing number, but that there's kind of a pattern to it, right? That in the the these gray bars represent recessions. Now, right? Don't forget that recessions are measured by um, declines, right? As a, G, a negative GDP growth, basically, for like a, a certain period of time, and that it's usually not possible to tell. Um, that we're in a recession or that there's been a recession until um, some time has passed. Not a long time, but, you know, it's 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 measured in months and not days. And so retroactively, we can go back and look at when, in fact, the economy was contracting. And you can see that a contracting economy is strongly link, linked with rapid increases in unemployment, right? So if we look at recessions in 1950, 1955, 1958, 1960... 1970, 1975, um, 1980, first and second, right? And then the brief recession in 1990, 2000, 2008, right? All of these recessions, all of the recessions correspond to a sudden and sharp rise in unemployment. And this makes sense, right? This is, this is consistent with the story that we experience, right? That the economy takes a turn for the worse. We all kind of realize ra rather quickly that things are going bad and um, companies immediately react by cutting expenses and, um, and uh, fire, you know, firing employees, doing layoffs. Um, and, and, and this, and it happens rather quickly. So you can see, right, this is just in a matter of a couple months, you see increases of unemployment from say five to nine in the example of 1975 or 7 to 11 in 1982, right? That these are, or right, if we go to the Great Recession, um, 5 to 10, right? So these are drastic, sudden changes in the employment rate, unemployment rate. And then, and you can see there's sort of a pattern. So at least in the, in the 50s and 60s, there was um, pretty uh, rapid uh, return to employment again, right? So the unemployment would spike, and then it would spike back down again. Um, but over time, right, so that was the case in the 50s and 60s. But if you look at 1970, there was a recession that caused a spike in unemployment. And it that picture did not rapidly change. In fact, between 70 and 75, right, we see 
the unemployment dip from six to five. And so by the time we have another recession, which shoots it up to nine, we hadn't really recovered from the previous recession. And um, in this case, right between 75 and 80, unemployment decreased at a more rapid pace, but not as rapid as we saw back in the 50s and 60s. Um, and, and then we get right back to um, rapid rises in unemployment again. Um, but looking at right the, the decade of the 90s, even though this is considered... A very, you know, this is a, that's a really positive economic time for the United States. You can see right in the early 90s, unemployment was as high as 8%, and that this is declining at a fairly slow rate, that, that unemployment is not jumping back to low numbers like it did in the 50s and 60s. And this is true all through since 1990, right? So since the 2000 recession and the 2008 recession, unemployment numbers decrease um, slowly rather than quickly. So they increase quickly and decrease slowly. And in, in economics, we have a metaphor, it's called rockets and feathers, right? So it rockets up and then floats down. And that's didn't used to be true for unemployment and, and now it is. So we can think of what the structural reasons are for that. Um, if I was to just conjecture, I might think it has something to do with, um, with technology, right? That a lot of, um, a lot of job losses now require retraining into new industries, which takes time. So when you have um, a lot of the labor being unskilled labor, it's easy to switch from one to another. But in modern times, uh, a lot of careers require specialized training. And so it's, it's not quick or easy to retool from an industry or career that was, hurt, that was damaged significantly by a recession. So this is um, just the sort of the global landscape for, for unemployment in the last 70 years. And you can see um, this, this unemployment rate that we're observing now is pretty close to about the bottom that it's been for a long time. So briefly in the, you know, in the early 1950s, it dipped a little lower, um, but it hasn't ever recovered to that number since then. So um, you'll see, right, just recently in, in the news, they, you know, they, there's been discussion of fall, um, fall employment, or we we're at, at P, at, you know, at, at va the va unemployment value, right, that it's as low as it can reasonably go, and that basically um, everyone, you know, I, I think partly because there's some natural unemployment as people switch jobs, right, so if everybody is either working or having success finding new work, there's still a gap. Right. So if I, you know, so right, if I, um, if I am, uh, you know, a, a, an educated professional and I go job searching, even if I'm in demand, it may take me two months to go through all the interviews and do all the traveling I need to do to get to my new, um, to get to my new career point. And so there's a certain amount of natural unemployment that's just going to happen from job switching and we, we might be at that level. So if you think about from a supply and demand standpoint, right, if I have a whole bunch of employers, right, that demand jobs, so maybe demand for jobs keeps going up, but now we're at the limit where there's no more supply, right? We run out of people, there's no more supply. Well, if, if we know, right, from simple supply demand economics, when demand goes up and supply stays the same, that price should increase, right? That higher demand with the same supply should drive the leading price, increase prices. Well, in the labor market, increased prices means increased wages. So um, based on that simple analysis, we would expect, and then the short term, we would see um, significant increases in wages, that we would see wage growth. That hasn't actually happened. So we haven't, um, I mean, wages are growing, but wages are growing at um, roughly just above the rate of inflation and not any higher than they have been growing in recent times. So this, there's there's a bit of a mystery that that I think we can resolve. So, um, but before we get into it, um, just a, a fun little uh, fact. So this is unemployment in 2013, and you can see there's pretty significant differences in um, uh, the geographic location of unemployment. So uh, unemployment is super low through the Dakotas, Nebraska, Kansas, and Oklahoma. Or you can see there's a it's that big black. Um, circle there, right there in the middle of the of the breadbasket on the Great Plains, and um, and uh, we know 
can kind of understand why this is not a huge demand to move to those Great Plains states. And at this point, there was a lot of investment in oil and gas that was occurring. And, um, and so those, but I mean, uh, unemployment is continually low in those regions. So that's interesting. But um, what, what I want to take a look at, or that I think is, is was more interesting, is to look at where unemployment is high. And you can see, obviously, out west, you know, there's significant unemployment in California, Oregon, and Washington in 2013. Um, but uh, and those and those counties are really big, so we don't get um, a lot of fine grained detail. Um, some of those eastern California counties are are very um, low population level, so um, it actually maybe overstates the California unemployment position. Like if we look at all the major metros, they're you know that it's not bright red squares. Um, but I think it's more interesting is to go into the smaller counties in the southeast, and you can see there is a very there is an unemployment kind of uh, man. What do you want to call that shape? It starts sort of starts in South Carolina and winds through Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, up along the boundary with Arkansas, and comes up into Tennessee. Um, that there's kind of this little swoosh. And if you look carefully, maybe it might even go up north through Mississippi, get to Kentucky, and then come back down along Arkansas and Louisiana. Um, so this is obviously not a legal boundary. There's some sort of something else going on because it just, it's just hopping over state boundaries like it doesn't even matter. Um, so this is actually really fun and sort of interesting um, connection between economics and uh and geology, actually. So uh, I'm going to hop down here and take a look at, a, you know, sort of this fun thing. So if you look over on the right, this is actually what North America looked like during the Cretaceous or in the times of the dinosaurs. Um, so there's a big inland sea that covered most of the Great Plains all the way up to um, the Yukon. But you'll see that the, the Florida is completely underwater. And that the coastline is actually significantly um, in, significantly in from from where it was, um, where it is today, and that the so the coast right so the coast of what would be the United States is runs through um, the middle of Virginia, South Carolina, Georgia, um, Alabama, and that sort of turns right in Mississippi and goes up into Tennessee and then back down. Um, through along the edge of Arkansas towards Louisiana. Well, if that little description of a line sounds familiar, you'd be right. So if we, I, you know, just for fun, I overlaid those two things. You can see that um, that the, uh, the the coastline of the United States, you know, the not you know, the, of of North America in the time of you know the late time of the dinosaurs, um, very closely tracks are unusually large unemployment rates throughout the Southeast. So, um, well, that's certainly interesting. So what's going on? Well, the, the, there's kind of fun sort of a uh, story there. So the, that, that coastline there you can see is actually quite shallow. So there's not a huge, um, it's not a huge difference between, I um, mean, just in elevation between the middle of Georgia and the coast of Georgia and so on. Right. So, so this, this ocean that covers all of this, land area is actually a very shallow sea. Um, and if you know anything about, you know, shallow, shallow ocean, it can be, um, it can be very, uh, very uh, biologically vibrant. So there's a ton of, um, you know, anim animals and plants that lived in that area that, you know, for, you know, millions and millions of years. And so their, their life and death along this coastline would um, accumulate. Eventually they, you know, they're, you know, the bodies would pile up and, and it produced like a sort of a chalky sort of um, bedrock that, that um, became very amenable to soil. So actually right along this coast, along this old coastline is really great agricultural land. So, um, so that actually led to, right, it led to changes in immigration patterns. It leads to right, changes in um, the type of industry that was going on at, in this in this area around the you know during colonial times and so there are because the geology 
of this coastline is different in our time, um, that geology feeds into differences in, um, in economics and in um, demographics and all sorts of stuff, right? So there's, uh, so yeah, so you actually, so you can, so the point is you can see the coastline, the Cretaceous coastline in the unemployment rate. Um, so here's our different graph. So this is a graph of, no, this is zoomed in, right? So this is 1999 to 2003. So this is just that little window. So if we go back to here, this is the recession, um, this is that recession in 2002 that, or 2001, that 2001 recession. Um, but right at 2000, we had really, really low unemployment, right? It's sort of as low as it can go, we claim. And if you look, so back in 2000, when unemployment was really, really low, we had wage gains in the 4.244% rate. So this is tweet, right? It was 4.4%. At that time, now it's 2.6, but our unemployment rate is at that level again, right? It's actually 4.0% in the most recent data. So, so this is a question, right? So why are we currently experiencing uh, really, you know, historically low unemployment, right? Really low unemployment, as you know, as low as 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 you it usually occurs at the bottom in in our uh, in our history. So we have really low unemployment. But we're not seeing wage gains, right? So wages aren't growing, but unemployment is still low. Um, why is that? So, so there is, so there's some explanations, and it, and um, I think the best one comes from thinking about how the unemployment as unemployment rate as we currently measure it might be um, might be uh, misrepresenting the state of the economy a little bit. So we, so we know, right? We've had we. I mentioned before that um, if you're if you're taking up if you're if you're sitting out right if you've elected to not um, pursue work that you're excluded for the unemployment rate for good reason so something we can check then oops is the oops sorry is the labor participation rate so this is the um, percentage of people from ages 25 to 54 that are currently employed, um, right? So uh, this this is a different way of addressing this um, um, retirement issue and school age issue. Well, certainly, right, there are 50-year-olds that are retired. Um, that's a small proportion of 50-year-olds. And there are certainly uh, people who are still pursuing education full-time at age 25. I was one of them. Um, but in general, this should sort of encapsulate people who have the potential to be working. And we can see here at the end of the Great Recession that only 75% of the people that are really, we, we are fairly confident should be eligible to work were actually working. And that this was drastically lower than had uh, occurred even, right, don't remember, don't forget there was, you know, uh, 1990-ish we had, there was a recession back there. So, I mean, if you look, this is this 2010 number is just a really low participation rate. Um, and that reflects, again, right, the, the notion that at, at, there's a result of the Great Recession, people just were um, sitting out, right, or ultimately ended up sitting out. So we have, we have low participation rate. But over time, this has recovered. So, you know, if we get up to 2018, we can see that participation is now up at, you know, 79% instead of 75. But, right, if... If, if we look though, right, so this, this number of 79%, that is almost as low as participation got in all of the 1990s, right? So if we go back to just a little after 1990, um, not, 78 was the lowest, and then it went all the way up to 82. So we finally climbed our way back up to participating as high as we were in the worst period of the 1990s, right? And this is... And this is important. So we, why? So why are um, so few people in this age um, group? And just and right, why are so many? Why are we seeing such low um, employment part participation rates, even as unemployment is so low? And um, and that, I don't have an answer for that. 
I mean, that's that's a sort of a fascinating question. What's going on? Why are people not working, but never so, but nevertheless, um, not unemployed? So you know, again, these must be pe people opting out. But um, what's happening with it? So I've heard I've heard some theories. I mean, it could be um, it can be um, disability, right? That we're seeing more and more people that are becoming disabled at work and therefore aren't participating. Um, the, uh, right, if you have, um, that maybe the opiate epidemic is a contributing factor, right, that as uh, an addict, you might not be pursuing work because you need to get clean before you can reasonably look for jobs. I mean, there's lots of stories here, but regardless, this, you know, this is sort of explaining why we may not see wage gains or at least haven't yet, because even though unemployment is historically low, there are lots of people available still to work, potentially. Um, now, we don't know why they're sitting out. So, um, But the reality is maybe as employers become more desperate, they will go find people who are, were sidelined that can come back to work instead of raising wages. Or they might wa raise wages, and time, only time will tell. Um, Again, that also presupposes we don't have another recession on the horizon, um, which, of course, I mean, you can almost always expect one to come sometime, but how soon and for how long and how bad will it be is a question. So that's a fun, um, fun, you know, fun little interesting thing to think about. Also, um, if I, I skipped this New York Times quote, um, but the unemployment rate actually rose this most recent data point. But it's for an interesting reason why, right? So it went from 3.8 to 4%. Um, but but actually, um, the labor force rose by 601,000 people. So more people working than before, um, which you would think normally wouldn't increase the unemployment rate. But um, right, so um, so the participation rate increased by 0.2%. So we actually have more people participating in this last data. But the unemployment rate rose because um, there are a bunch of people now looking for work and um, if you're so, and they that weren't before, so we have more people looking. That means more people unemployed, and the result is an increase in the unemployment rate. So even though unemployment went up, it went up because we are drawing in people that were sidelined from the labor market before. So that's at least some indication that that story is is happening. Um, and so, um, right, that's again important to think about when targeting the unemployment rate as some kind of uh, policy benchmark or barometer that we think about these consequences that maybe um, good policies that bring people from the sidelines into the labor market might increase the unemployment rate in the short term that that's and that's good it's the same thing with extending unemployment benefits right so if i you know in the wake of the great recession um the government um extended or increased unemployment benefits um i think in partly in the hope that it would give people time to uh, retrain into new industries since there were you know really serious um, problems in, in some major industries in the United States um, which in effect you could think about being a great opportunity if you're a, a worker that was laid off from an industry that has reduced employment you use the time and the unemployment checks you're receiving to go get trained in something different then later you emerge from unemployment and found a, a better job um, you still sat on unemployment longer maybe than you would have if you weren't extended a generous unemployment benefit. You know, if that if your unemployment benefits disappeared in three days, well, maybe you might go find work really, really quick, even if the job was bad, right? So, so version A, where you get a big unemployment benefit, leads to higher unemployment, but better employment and a more humane existence for everyone involved versus option B, where basically you just get hit on the head with a hammer until you go do literally anything and the unemployment rate goes down. So um, as with many things in economics, there's lots of competing factors to think about. Um, but the, the especially just with participation, especially is something we have to think carefully when we talk about unemployment. Um, so just to um, highlight this point, so this is a, uh, a graph, right? So in, we, we've talked about scatter plots. Right. This is this is a scatter plot of something that's working. Right. You can see that this is an it's not a circle. Right. This is a very you know oblong shape that as the employment cost index goes up, the um, participation rate goes up. And the green dots are all from the the time period from 1999 to 2000, 
and the yellow dots are from recent times. And so, right, both these cases had low unemployment, right? The green dots had low unemployment and the yellow dots had low unemployment. Both had low unemployment. But in the green case, we had really high workforce participation. That meant it was harder for companies to go find sidelined workers. And so they ended up having, um, we seeing significant wage gains for workers in the United States. Whereas recently we haven't. So um, work based on employment participation, that's not a surprise, right? If we look at yellow, we wouldn't expect to see big wage gains because we still have a lot of non-participants. Um, whereas in the green, we didn't and we would expect to see big wage gains. So based on unemployment, that doesn't make sense, but based on participation, it does. Um, yeah, so in the next segment, we will get into thinking about um, how things like unemployment and, um, and global, right, so how, and how, how unemployment looks across the globe or, and how different factors and the nature of different countries feed into um, economic development and and how you know so how so how these differences across countries affect um, the you know the, the the experiences of people in the workforce right we already looked at something like that when you're thinking about the you know when we looked at the geology or in the southeast but you know we'll follow more with that in in a bit. <laughs>